Welcome everyone to this session on the data protection principles. My name's Eleanor Deuce and I'm a lawyer at Field Fisher in London and with me on this webinar is my colleague Natalie Barnfield. This is part of our series Get Data Protection Fit. This is part as well of module one of Get Data Protection Fit and it's the second segment, the data protection principles. In this session, I'm going to briefly recap the first segment of module one, where we talked about key concepts in data protection law. And then we're going to look at an overview of the seven data protection principles. In terms of learning outcomes for this session, by the end of the session, you should be better able to explain the importance of the data protection principles and describe the seven principles. So firstly, the recap from segment one of module one, key concepts in data protection law. You'll remember that we talked about how the roots of data protection law are deep, how Hundreds of years ago, we fought for our freedoms in the real world. And now we're having a similar fight in the virtual or digital world. And that's what data protection law is essentially about. In terms of the roots of the legislation, it goes back to the European Convention on Human Rights, and in particular, Article 8, the right to a private and family life. And we talked about how data protection law could be described or thought of as a house. There are the main building blocks, like the bricks, concepts like controller, processor, personal data and processing. And we talked about how the key principles are a little bit like cement that hold the house together. The principles flow through data protection law and give it its coherence. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in this session. Next, we talked about how a house is there for the individuals who live in it to give them protection. And data protection law is a little bit similar in that sense. It gives rights to individuals. But it doesn't just apply within the confines of the building itself. It also applies more widely out in the wider environment. And we talked about transfers of data and how even though these transfers are taking place outside that protected sphere, the data itself is also protected even outside the confines of the house. So now I'm going to hand over to Natalie to introduce you to the seven data protection principles. Thank you, Eleanor. That brings us to the substance of our segment, the seven data protection principles. And just to reiterate what Eleanor just explained, um, if, if the main data protection concepts of personal data controller and processor are like the building blocks of our data protection house, the data protection principles are very much like the cement that hold it all together and that can be seen flowing through it. They are essentially the expression of the core values of data protection law. They sit at the heart of the GDPR and they underpin all of the other more prescriptive obligations under it. And we'll come on to explain some of these in more detail in future segments and modules. As the ICO's own guidance says, they are set out right at the start of the legislation and they inform everything that follows. And if I haven't hammered home quite how important they are, their importance are also reflected in the fact that failure to comply with them carries a risk of the higher tier of fines available under the GDPR. That's a fine of up to 20 million euros or 4% of worldwide turnover, whichever's higher. And again, that's something that we'll come on to explain in more detail in future modules. 
So if we start from the very beginning, a very good place to start. Principle one. Now, principle one requires that personal data is processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. There are three quite distinct limbs to this principle, but fundamentally, it's all about using personal data in the right way, in an ethical way, and in a way which respects individuals' human rights. But turning to each of these limbs in a little bit more detail, lawfully. What does it mean to process personal data lawfully for the purposes of pr principle one? Well, first and foremost, you have to have a lawful basis to process the personal data. Now, this is something that we touched on briefly in segment one, and I understand we'll build on in more detail in the next segment. But in brief, the GDPR requires you to satisfy one of a finite number of grounds or legal bases in order to process personal data. In addition, use of personal data mustn't breach any other laws or otherwise be unlawful. A good example might be if you're using personal data in a way which breaches a duty of confidence. So your doctor, say, has a duty to keep your information or your health information confidential. So if they were to disclose your data in breach of that confidence, the use or the disclosure might be considered unlawful under principle one. Fairly. Fundamentally, the concept of fair processing means that you have to use personal data in a way that's fair. This means that you shouldn't be processing it in ways that could go beyond the reasonable expectations of an individual or in ways that might be considered unduly detrimental or misleading. And the ICO's guidance on this makes clear that you need to consider how the processing might affect individuals and whether you can justify any adverse impact. Transparently, um, I suppose, is, is linked to fairness in some, some ways. It's about being clear, open and honest with people about how and why you intend to use their personal data. Now, there are more pres prescriptive obligations under the GDPR about transparency and, and how and why and but in, by what means you're expected to be clear, open, honest. And we'll explain more about this in future segments. Principle two requires that personal data should not be collect should be collected for specified explicit and legitimate purposes and not further processed in a manner which is incompatible with those processes purposes excuse me it's also referred to by the gdpr as the purpose limitation principle and actually i think that's an easy way to think about it the substance isn't really helpfully drafted because fundamentally Principle two is about ensuring that you've properly identified and spelled out the purposes or the boundaries within which you intend to use or process personal data and that you only use personal data within the confines of those defined boundaries. I suppose it really boils down to don't collect data for one purpose and use it for another. And if you do decide to use it for another purpose, just like a game of snakes and ladders, you'd have to go back to the first principle to ensure that the new use is fair, lawful and transparent. Principle three. This requires that personal data is adequate, relevant and limited to what's necessary in relation to the purposes for which they're processed. It's referred to under the GDPR as the data minimization principle, and essentially it requires controllers to minimize the amount of personal data that they're collecting, limiting it only to the personal data that they need, and not to collect excessive amounts of data in this mindset that it might one day be useful or, or needed. 
in in many ways each of the limbs are, are pretty self-explanatory but if we just put them under the lens for a few moments in terms of adequate ensuring that data is adequate is about ensuring that you've collected a sufficient amount of it to properly fulfill your stated purpose so the ICO actually uses a helpful example of a membership club. Um, and this is a club that starts out with only a handful of members um, and only collects basic and name and email address um, in the first instance. And as its membership grows rapidly, it becomes necessary to collect additional information so that the club can identify its different members and keep track of their membership status. Relevant is about ensuring that the data you're collecting is relevant um, to, to the purpose for which you intend to use it. So it's about establishing a link between the data you're collecting and the purpose. So, for example, if you're inviting someone to apply for a job, uh, say an administrative or an office job, it would not be relevant to ask that applicant for details about health conditions that, that say, might only be relevant um, to a more manual op occupation. Limited is um, in some ways connected to relevance. And again, it's, it's all about just collecting what you need and no more. Thank you very much, Natalie. So I'm going to pick it up now at Principle four, accuracy, which says that personal data must be accurate and, where necessary, kept up to date. What does that mean? Well, it means that you have to make sure that the personal data that you hold isn't incorrect or misleading, and you might need to make sure that you keep it up to date. So what does this mean in practice? You should, according to the regulator, the Information Commissioner's Office, make sure that you take steps to ensure the accuracy of the personal data that you hold, ensure that its source and its status is clear, and think about whether it needs to be updated. So to unpack this a little bit, what does accurate actually mean? Well, it means correct as to fact. So the easiest way to illustrate this is with an example. So if an individual moves house from London to Edinburgh and a record says that they're currently living in London, then that is inaccurate. It's, it's wrong as to fact. But if the record said that the individual had lived in London and they no longer lived there but lived in Edinburgh, then that would be correct. So that's simple enough, but it does become more complicated. What about records of mistakes, for example? So say you've been subject to a parking fine, which was unfairly um, imposed on you by the council. Individuals often will write in and say, this was unfair and the penalty shouldn't stand. And if they're successful, then it doesn't. But sometimes they say that this principle means that the entire record of the episode should be removed because it was based on an inaccuracy, the fact that you were breaching the parking restrictions. That isn't really what this principle is about. So very often, a record will need to be kept of a decision, even if it was later reversed, and that can be in the interests of the individual concerned. So that's records of mistakes, and those can often still stand and even do so and be compatible with this principle. And in terms of keeping records up to date, well, some records, of course, do need to be kept up to date. But think of this example. Say somebody has bought something from a website. The organisation will probably need to keep the record for 
accounting purposes or perhaps because there might be a complaint about the particular item. But they don't keep having to check that the individual still lives at the address to which the particular item was sent. That wouldn't really be reasonable. So kept up to date where necessary is a really important caveat to this concept. And finally, what about opinions? Some people say, oh, I know that there's an opinion recorded about me, and I don't think it's accurate, so I want it to be deleted, for example. How does that principle apply in this situation? Well, opinions are slightly different because they're not about matters of fact, as we talked about earlier. They're about people's subjective views about things. And the fourth principle doesn't cut across opinions. So you're entitled to have a record of your opinion, even though somebody else might dispute it, because opinions are just what people think about things. They're not really about factual accuracy as such. So that's the fourth principle. Coming on now to principle five, storage limitation. Principle five says that personal data should be kept in a form which permits identification of data subjects for no longer than is necessary. What does this actual, actually mean? Well, if you collect data fairly and lawfully and in accordance with those principles that Natalie's talked about, even if that's the case, you shouldn't keep it for longer than you actually need it. And that's what the storage limitation principle is all about. There are quite practical reasons why the storage limitation principle makes business sense as well as being part of data protection law. It's costly to store data that you don't need. And so having set periods for keeping the data and then deleting it makes a lot of sense. And how long you keep the data will depend on the context and the purposes for which you're keeping it. The GDPR doesn't set out prescriptive timeframes. It's up to each controller to decide whether they can justify keeping the data for a particular period of time and also the point at which they should be deleting it. So let's take an example. Say a bank has CCTV outside and it does that because it wants to record who's withdrawing money from the cash point. The reason for doing that, of course, is fraud, that somebody might impersonate someone else and take out money from their account illegally. So the CCTV is part of ensuring that that doesn't happen and protecting customers. How long should that CCTV be kept for? Well, it makes sense not to delete it straight away because a customer might look at their monthly statement and say, hang on, I didn't take that money out at that cash point at that time on that particular day. And the CCTV might help to explain what's actually happened in these circumstances. So it might need to be kept for a month or two, but to keep it for five years would make no sense at all because it's very unlikely that the customer would come back after that amount of time and say, oh, I don't think that transaction was a proper transaction. So you see the reasoning here. You've got to justify why it's necessary to keep the data, but to keep it for no longer than is necessary. And Another example might be an application for a job. In terms of the unsuccessful candidates, their forms, their application forms, could be kept until the end of the period where they could complain to an employment tribunal about discrimination in terms of the way that the application process was run. So to keep it for that period of time is consistent with the storage limitation period but keeping it for longer wouldn't be. So in terms of practical steps here, the thing to think about is how long do you need the data for? You should review it periodically 
and you should either erase it or anonymize it when you no longer need it. So that's the storage limitation principle, principle five. And next we come on to the security principle. Personal data should be protected against unauthorized or unlawful processing and accidental loss, destruction or damage. As Natalie was saying, some of these principles really are almost self-explanatory. We've all heard so many stories about hacking, about people's data being lost, being left somewhere, being in a laptop which is stolen, which happens to have been unencrypted and not properly secured. So we all hear these stories a lot and the security principle is really important but it more or less does what it says on the tin. You need to protect the personal data that you hold. And you need to do so in an appropriate way. And again, when I talked about the storage limitation period, there's no prescriptive period set out for storage of personal data. And in the same way, there are no prescriptive standards by which data should be protected. It's a matter of considering the sort of data that you hold the context in which you hold it, and therefore the appropriate security measures that you need to put in place in order to keep it safe. And the final principle, principle seven, is the accountability principle. And that says that the controller's responsible for and should be able to demonstrate compliance with the principles. Now, what does this mean? Well, we'll be talking in later segments and later modules about how you demonstrate compliance with the principles and the sorts of notices and policies that you as an organization should have in place in order to make sure that you are complying with the GDPR and the accountability principle. But there's been quite a lot of discussion about accountability in recent months. At the start of the GDPR journey, as it were, when it came into force and everyone was drafting notices and making sure that they had everything in place to be compliant, that first phase needed to be translated into something more. And the Information Commission has talked quite a lot about this. And this is all to do with accountability, that we're now moving from that first phase of having all the documents in place, to a second phase of actually weaving them into the culture of our organizations. And the information commissioner said that data protection should be part of the cultural and business fabric of an organization. So that means that data protection is something that everyone in the organization is aware of and is part of the way in which business is done, respecting people's personal data and ensuring that it is properly protected and kept and processed in accordance with these seven principles and the GDPR more generally. So that's the final principle, the accountability. So we talked at the start about the learning outcomes and we said that by the end of the session, you should be better able to explain the importance of the data protection principles. Well, as Natalie said, they are absolutely fundamental. They're an expression of the core values of the GDPR, of data protection law. And we went through the seven principles. The first principle, that data should be processed lawfully, fairly and transparently. That means in accordance with the law, in accordance with the GDPR framework and other duties, such as the duty of confidentiality, which Natalie mentioned, and that you should be fair with what you're doing with the data, that you should tell people what they're doing, that, that what you're doing, that it should be something that's expected by them, that they shouldn't be misled about what you're doing with their personal data, and you should be transparent and clear about what's happening. Secondly, the purpose limitation principle. The idea that you shouldn't use data for one purpose and then for a different purpose unless you've gone back through the first principle and made sure that your second purpose 
is compatible with those concepts of lawfulness, fairness and transparency. We talked about data minimization, that you shouldn't collect more data than you need for your purposes. We talked about the importance of accuracy, making sure that data where it needs to be is up to date and reflective of the true position. We talked about the fifth principle, storage limitation, that you shouldn't keep data for longer than you need to. The sixth principle of security and the seventh principle, which in a way holds the whole concept together, accountability, making sure that you are demonstrating compliance with the GDPR, but also going that step further and really weaving it into the fabric of your organization and that data protection is part of your business values. So that brings us to the end of the second segment of module one, the data protection principles. Next time, we'll be looking at the grounds for processing personal data. And here uh, we are, uh, Natalie and I, and our contact details, should you wish to get in touch with us, any of this. Thank you very much.